here today is not to be considered legal advice. Uh, it's not intended to be. It's a strictly educational. So if there's anything that comes up, uh, still be sure to contact your association counsel if you have any questions or need to proceed with some of the items we speak about today. So uh, I want to introduce first our our guest. Our guest today is from Angus and Terry. He's one of the founding partners, Mr. Paul Terry. Paul uh, is uh, going to be our, our guest speaker today. And our host of today's show, The Gray Area, uh, is Fred Gray. Fred Gray is the uh, partner of Gray Systems, a elite educational program for CAMS, for uh, uh, continuing education credits, real estate professionals, construction uh, general contractors. Fred, I'd like to turn it over to you and let's get the show on the road. Fred, you're Thank muted. You, Fred, uh, <laughs> Fred, Please unmute. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, very much for getting us started here. And thank you, Paul, for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. Happy uh, to be here. Today's major topic is going to be construction defects. That's what uh, Angus and Terry specialize in. Uh, we have some uh, a kind of a roundtable discussion we're going to enter into, and I'm going to be questioning uh, Paul, answering his questions first or his uh, topics first. Uh, then we're going to open it up. Also, as Jeff said, as we go through, if you do have questions or uh, concerns, either raise your hand or enter something in the uh, chat room, and uh, we will be able to uh, address those as much as close as we can based on the time that we have. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to begin here. And Paul, I'm going to ask you the, the major question here. What's the most important thing for a manager or a board member to know about construction defense? Um, well, thank you, uh, Fred, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the most important thing for any manager or board member to know about construction defects is something called the statute of limitations. And the reason that that's so important is because if the statute of limitations expires on your claim, no matter how valid your claim might be, um, it will be barred uh, from, from being brought in court. So in Florida, we have two statutes. Uh, one is technically called the statute of repose, but you can just think of them all as statutes of limitation. Um, the first one uh, is 10 years, and it's 10 years um, roughly from when construction is completed, uh, uh, you know, going out 10 years from that point, there's some nuances to exactly when it starts. So that's not an absolute rule, but for general uh, understanding, it's 10 years from completion of construction. Uh, the second one, and the one that's a little bit trickier, uh, is a four-year statute of limitation. The four-year statute is different than a 10-year statute um, uh, in, in, in two respects. Um, number one, the, um, the four-year statute of limitations uh, starts to run when you're either on notice or you should be on notice with the exercise of reasonable diligence of a defective condition. Uh, the easiest one to think of is there's a roof leak. Uh, roofs are not supposed to leak. Uh, and so if there's a roof leak, um, uh, you're on notice. Um, the second thing about the four-year statute of limitations that's different is that it, it runs on a defect by defect basis. So for example, if you are aware of roof leaks um, uh, and you let four years go by so that you can't uh, bring a, a roof claim, um, you still would have other potential claims like stucco cracking, window leaks, um, you know, drainage issues, uh, you know, things like that. So the four-year statute is a, a just trickier just because of the fact um, that you it, it apply whether you're actually on notice or whether you should be on notice. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, aspect of this to be really careful about are for people who are in condominiums, um, as you may know, as part of the condominium turnover process, the builder is required to provide an engineering turnover report in which a Florida licensed engineer or architect uh, goes through the building systems. Uh, it's all visual, there's no uh, destructive testing, but they produce a report. That report will not describe any condition as a quote unquote defect, um, but it, it, it will uh, oftentimes disclose 
uh, defective conditions, just, just describing them like, you know, the, the floor slope uh, or the deck slope back into the building. Um, they're not going to say that's a defect, but you're on notice that that's going on. Um, and so therefore, four years after the turnover date, when you got that report, um, this four year statute of limitations will have run on everything that's in your turnover report. So that's just a little, a little nuance uh, to be aware of. Um, and then the other one, um, and this is really unique to Florida, is that um, in their infinite wisdom, our Supreme Court has ruled that if you get one roof leak, one roof leak, you are on notice that all the roofs in the entire project uh, may be defective and the four year statute of limitations is running. Um, with respect to other defects, it's not that draconian, um, but you just need to be aware, particularly managers, if you get one roof leak and, and, the, and the roof can come out and do the repair, uh, stand behind a warranty, doesn't matter, the four year statute of limitations is running as to every single roof in the entire development. So just be aware of that. Can I, can I ask you to expand on that, Paul, just for a moment? If you do sure. have two, the You've raised two questions that I wanted to be aware of, and I've been asked this before as well. Uh, since they started doing the uh, turnover engineering study by the developer, would that be a good time to have somebody engaged like you to analyze that turnover report? Uh, Absolutely, because, because of the fact that you, um, you very well might be uh, have it triggered the four-year statute. Uh, you need to have somebody take a look at that. Um, the other thing is that, um, and we can go over this in a second, there's a, a, a process, um, a pre-litigation process in Florida that, um, that you can go through or you're required to go through. Um, and uh, if, you, if you get a hold of that engineering report and there are things in there, um, that's a good time to go back to the developer uh, and, and see if you can get those conditions uh, corrected. Um, and I mean, I've seen a lot of developers uh, play, you know, play games with it. Like, well, I'm not required to fix that, or you know, that's not my responsibility, or or um, whatever. Um, uh, but it is their responsibility, so um, it's it's definitely a good thing to do. Um, there, and by the way, there are there are two um, two sort of broad categories of kinds of attorneys that do this kind of work. Some attorneys work only on an hourly basis. And so if you ask them to read the report, they will, and then they'll charge you. Um, attorneys uh, 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 like us, we do most of our cases on a contingency fee basis, uh, although we do some hourly, but mostly contingency. So when we're asked to read one of those engineering turnover reports, uh, we don't charge for doing that. Um, so we're happy to do that, take a look at it, meet with the board, especially now that you can do it by Zoom. It's really easy, uh, but, we're, but we're happy to do that. and. and um, um, and, and I, I always offer this to, to any manager. Um, if, you're, if you're concerned about something uh, or you're not sure what to do, um, please feel free to give me a call, send me a text, send me an email. Um, I'm never gonna charge you for that. Um, uh, I, I'd much rather get everybody, get everybody squared away and on the right path than have them hang back, not sure, be afraid to talk to an attorney, be afraid to ask a question. Uh, and it turns out that you end up waiving legal rights. So um, that's just um, uh, just a service that that, uh, that we offer. I'm happy to answer questions anytime without charge. Good, that's nice to know. Uh, to just to kind of expand on my, the big question here, uh, how, how does a, an association, primarily a condominium association, know that they have a construction defect? Well, um, no, no, bear in mind that, that, that you know, my area of specialization, um, you know, is uh, is these uh, construction defect claims, and there's a 10-year statute of limitations. So I primarily deal with projects that are 10 years old or less. And the and the real way um, that you can um, uh, tell that you have a defect uh, is that uh, you are performing repairs to a component. Um, that the reserve schedule is not calling for that component to wear out. Uh, and and uh, so if, you're, if your project is under 10 years and you're doing the repairs to virtually anything, um, odds are pretty good that's a construction defect. Now, all defects, all construction defects don't warrant uh, pursuing a claim against the developer. 
Um, a lot of times it's just faster, easier, and less expensive um, uh, to just take care of it yourself. So I, I don't want anybody thinking that um, I'm suggesting every time you have a little thing go wrong uh, that you should be you know, chasing the developer. Um, uh, but but it, it, the thing to want, you want to do though is you want to check with you know, somebody like us and we'll, we'll tell you, you know, yeah, that looks like it could be serious. Um, a lot of times we'll say, you know, I don't really know. So let me, uh, let me send out an engineer at my expense and have them take a look and, and, and give us a, a professional opinion as to whether or not um, this is something that, uh, that we need to worry about. Good. Nice to know. Thank you very much. Uh, should should a, a construction defect claim be a burden on a manager of the association? Um, well, at least in our firm, we don't think so. Um, um, uh, the, way, the way some firms practice, and this is something that you just want to ask about, um, because a lot of times you can negotiate for it, um, but you want to make sure that the law firm has enough staff, um, and by staff I mean like non-attorney staff, um, that they can do things like set up the site inspections, um, staff site inspections, coordinate repairs, uh, um, all of that stuff should be done by the law firm, uh, not by the manager. Um, that's just part of, of good service. And, and, and one of the things that you can do is that when you're interviewing attorneys uh, for uh, possible representation, um, those are claims that those are questions that you can and should ask. Okay, what, what are you going to expect the board to do? What are you going to expect the manager to do? Uh, who's going to organize the site inspections? Who's going to staff the site inspections? Uh, what about repairs? Um, all those things, um, you want to make sure that uh, the law firm is taken care of. Otherwise, uh, the manager, for one thing, they may be they likely are going to be charging you for that additional work that they have to do. Um, uh, but besides that, you know, managers are, are, are some of the hardest working people on the planet. And, um, uh, it, it, and I, sometimes I think construction defect claims can scare them because they're afraid they're going to be overwhelmed. And um, that's something that should be really be taken care of by the law firm. Good. Uh, another question that I wanted to ask you about as uh, the board of directors, uh, would it constitute a breach of fiduciary duty for the board not to pursue a construction defect claim? Well, well that's a great question. And, and it's one I actually get a lot. Um, and, and, it, and it comes up uh, oftentimes in the context of um, uh, well, there's one or two board members who think they should pursue a claim, and there's one or two board members who think they don't want to, they're, they're opposed to it, sometimes on philosophical reasons. Um, and, and, and when they're opposed, what they try and do is they try and um, uh, stop the board from gathering any information, because once you gather the information, then sometimes uh, the conclusion uh, is, is fairly obvious. Uh, so what, what, I, what I tell boards is that they don't have a fiduciary duty to pursue a claim. They have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interest of the association, but they can't act in the best interest of the association until they have all the facts. So they do have a fiduciary duty in this area, but that fiduciary duty is to conduct an investigation. Um, if you're only dealing with an attorney who bills hourly, um, that could be a little bit different because you may not have the money to conduct the investigation, but there are firms out there like ours but we're certainly not the only ones um, who do these cases on a contingency fee basis. And we'll go ahead and, and um, advance the money uh, to conduct uh, an engineering investigation uh, of conditions and then report back to the board as to whether in our opinion, um, it's something that's really worth pursuing. Um, you know, for our purposes, we don't really do um, small little ticky tacky cases. We don't do that. That's not what we're set up to do. And so, we're, we're happy to send out an engineer um, who we trust, uh, who will take a look at your project and tell you whether or not you got a little problem or whether or not you got a big problem. Um, because we wanna know that too. We don't wanna get involved in something uh, where we have a lot of our own resources tied up, but there's really not much chance of a, of a significant recovery. Um, so the straight answer to your question is no, there's no fiduciary duty, um, absolute fiduciary duty to pursue a claim, uh, but there really is a fiduciary duty to conduct an investigation if there's any indication that, that an investigation might be warranted. Okay. You mentioned something there about the owners. Uh, at what point in time should the board um, make the owners aware that there is a potential 
construction defect. And what, what uh, I guess, owners does that put on the owners for disclosure if they're trying to sell their- So um, um, there, there, there's a couple things about this. Uh, number one, um, communications between the attorney and the um, board of directors and the manager um, are protected by something called uh, the attorney client privilege. That means that the, uh, the builder and the builder's attorneys can never find out what was discussed. Um, uh, that does not necessarily extend communications between the, um, between the uh, uh, attorney and the individual owners. Um, and so we don't like board members uh, and managers to be discussing a construction defect claim directly with the owners um, because of the risk that they can uh, waive the attorney-client privilege. Um, so um, um, I think it's important that the members know what's going on as early as possible. Um, so for example, in our case, when we're retained, um, we'll send out an introduction letter uh, that goes to the um, that goes to the members that introduces who we are, tell them that we've been retained by the board uh, to conduct an investigation, is, which is what we're doing now. Um, there is no litigation yet. We have to determine whether or not there's a need for a claim, but that the board um, board is pursuing it. Um, and then the second thing that we do is we put a um, we give a, a letter that goes to the manager and it goes into their escrow package, uh, so that every time somebody requests. Um, uh, an escrow package, they get a short little letter that says, you know, there's an investigation for uh, construction defects and if a complaint is filed through litigation um, and that they can contact uh, the law firm uh, for, uh, for further information. Um, that way there's not pressure on the board and the manager to be answering questions. Um, they can come directly to us and um, uh, contrary to the way some people work, um, uh, we, we, we do answer the telephone. So we're not, we're not gonna ignore anybody. Um, we have dedicated people that are, that's their responsibility. And if they don't know the answer, they're gonna track one of us down. So um, uh, you, you, you need to make sure that the members know uh, because one of the things that can happen is that somebody sells their unit um, and, and doesn't make disclosure and there's no disclosure uh, in, in the escrow package. Um, and, and those owners um, show up at your board meeting uh, and they want to know when the heck you found out about this uh, and how come you didn't disclose it. And, and even though it might not be the association's direct responsibility, that's a, um, that's a very uncomfortable place to be, which is why we put um, a disclosure letter in the escrow file so that anybody who purchases um, uh, is actually on notice. And if they come and show up at a board meeting and start yelling and screaming about not knowing what was going on, you know, you can say, well, you, you can say with confidence, hey, well, it was in your escrow package. And so if you didn't read it, there's really nothing we can do about it. There's a question also about and um, about the 10 year uh, statute of limitations. Uh, you mentioned before, you know, the claim would not be valid after 10 years in most cases. Uh, so after 10 years, would there be any value in pursuing uh, that claim or anything like that? Um, well, what we, what we prefer to have somebody do um, is if they're anywhere close um, is to, in their, and, and I think they might have some construction defect issues, is go ahead and give us a call and, um, and let us take a look at it. Um, you know, I, I've given you sort of a, um, sort of a broad brush rule that it's, you know, 10 years from completion of construction, but there are ways that that can be extended by, by some periods of time. Um, so you shouldn't, if you're at, you know, 10 years and six months, uh, you shouldn't just automatically assume that you're out beyond the statute. You know, that's, that's what we're here for. So why don't you, you know, give us a call, send us an email, let us take a look at it and then form an opinion as to whether or not um, uh, you, you, you have a, the ability to pursue a claim. Uh, don't, don't count yourself out until you've had somebody uh, like us, or again, I don't want to say that we're the only people who do it. There are others out there. Um, um, uh, that, that, that can do it. But, um, you know, if you get out, let's say like, you know, you're 12 years out or 13 years out, really, there's at that point, there really won't be anything that anybody can do to help you. Um, but if you're right, just past 10 years, you know, absolutely um, uh, give, give a question um, or, you know, or give a question to us and, and you know, let us take a look at it or, or somebody else that like us. Because um, again, we're not going to charge for it. So um, it's kind of, there's no reason really not to do it. Well, but following up on that, uh, the, the way that you are compensated, or 
I know in dealing with my managers and my the boards that I work with, anytime I say the word attorney, everybody cringes uh, because <laughs> they're going out the door. Uh, and also, I've had discussions with uh, boards before, and they say, we think we have a problem with our building. Uh, how do we find out? How much money do we have to spend to find out about this? Can you kind of touch on that process of how do you fund um, sure, sure. So when when we're contacted, um, uh, usually there's a particular issue that's um, that's uh, troubling the owners, um, and, and that's the impetus for them to contact us. Um, uh, and, and and really, uh, other than meeting with the board the first time, uh, the first thing that we're going to do um, is we're going to send out uh, an engineer um, to do uh, what I call uh, kind of a kick the tire sort of thing. Spend a day day and a half out at your project walking around. Um, sometimes I'll walk around with a board president um, or the um, or another member of the board who's familiar with the issues that are going on. Um, that, that certainly facilitates the process. And then, um, and we do that, uh, as I said, we do that um, uh, on our own nickel. Um, uh, we'll, we'll want somebody to sign a fee agreement so that, so that if in fact we pursue a claim, we have an ability to, to get the money back. But, um, but we'll go ahead and advance the expense for that. So the fact that they don't have the money uh, or they don't, even don't, they don't even have to want to spend the money, um, uh, we'll go ahead and do that for them um, just because um, uh, that's how we do business. And we want to make sure, again, we want to make sure that if we're going to get involved and devote a lot of resources, uh, and those resources can be you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, you know, out of our own pocket, we want to make sure that there's enough of a claim there that, that justifies you know, that kind of expense. So. Um, give us a call. We'll, we'll have somebody take a look. So your actual compensation would come from the award, damage award. That's that's correct. When we're on a, a again, we do some cases like like some sometimes on big high rise cases they'll want to go hourly, which is fine. But for most people, contingency fee cases are are, are what um, are what makes mm -hmm. sense. And, um, and 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 yeah, we will advance all the expenses. Um, the association will never write a check, um, so we get. Uh, paid our fee and reimbursed our expenses out of the recovery. And if God forbid there wasn't a recovery, um, the association would not owe us anything. So uh, we take all the risk, which again is why we wanna make sure at the very outset that there's really something going on um, before, uh, before we get too, too involved. Um, uh, there's a couple qu questions here. You may have already seen these, um, Fred. Um, one of them is about an online resource to see how many claims have been filed against a developer or vendor um, other than a government site? And the answer is, I'm not aware of uh, such a site. Um, you know, the, the only thing you can do is you can do searches for cases that have been filed. Um, uh, you can also contact the Better Business Bureau, uh, but other than that, no. And- uh, I, saw, I saw that question and I was gonna relate that to you, but there, there is no, uh, uh, repository of these cases, you have to go through and search court cases and- That's uh, correct, that's correct. That's kind of things as well. Um, and because that moves outside of the regular uh, regulatory structure, it goes beyond the regulators as well. And people, a lot of people don't realize too, Paul, and I'm, I'm kind of throwing things out here. When you're doing a construction defect uh, issue, we're here going after primarily the developer of the project. I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong. And then there's also been involving the, the contractors that are involved in the project as well. Oh. As part of it, I think, as well. Can you kind yes. of touch on Well, let, 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 me, let me do this, um, uh, Fred. Maybe, maybe this will help some people. We, it, it addresses some of the questions we got about how the, the basic process works. Um, so the, the first step uh, in Florida is to, uh, there's a, a pre-litigation process that you're required to go through before you can file a lawsuit against the builder. Um, it's located in um, uh, chapter 558. Um, and so sometimes you will hear people refer to a 558 notice or a 558 claim. Um, it's the same thing as a construction defect claim. They're, they're interchangeable. And, and the way the process works is that you send a notice to the builder um, in, a, in a specific form. 
uh, and you um, identify what you believe are defective conditions, um, and you are also required to identify um, where in the project you have observed them um, so that the developer can come and look. When the developer receives um, one of these notices, uh, they have 30 days to notify their subcontractors. Um, if it's a separate general contractor, then they would notify them as well. Um, and then they have uh, 50 days, total 50 days to conduct an inspection if they wish. And they have 75 days to respond um, to the notice of claim or the 558 notice. Um, and, then the, um, and then the association can, can respond. The association has no obligation um, to accept any offer that the developer makes, um, although they certainly can. Um, and one, one I, I think, um, uh, very important uh, note to take here, uh, and if you don't take anything else away, uh, please remember this. A lot of people will pursue a 558 claim, and a lot of times they'll do it uh, through their community association or their general counsel attorney, um, and the uh, developer will come back and they will offer them uh, what is, uh, seems like a lot of money, let's say, $25,000 or $50,000. Um, uh, and, 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 they'll, and they'll want though the association to sign what's called a general release in exchange for that money. And the problem with that is that although $50,000 may seem like a lot of money, uh, if in fact you have a $2 million construction defect claim, um, that $50,000 is not gonna help you too much. Uh, and, and so before anybody signs a release, um, you need to make sure um, that you've spoken to a construction defect attorney who understands how the process works um, and, and any construction defect attorney worth their salt is going to make sure an engineer takes a look at the project so you don't end up uh, collecting $50,000 uh, and then waiving you know, millions of dollars in, in claims that, uh, that you potentially could have brought uh, and that are going to show up you know, someplace down the road. Um, and uh, we just had one of those last week where somebody had some pretty significant uh, defects in, in their stucco um, and they had, they had gotten $25,000 signed a general release. It was very carefully written by a very skillful attorney um, and it was binding. Um, there's no, there was no way for them to get around it. Um, so, uh, so just be aware that if you, if you pursue one of these 558 claims uh, with somebody that's not prepared to, to litigate um, all the way to the end, um, you may end up giving away way more in rights um, than, than you should have. So, um, uh, so just be, be, be aware of that. And again, if you, if you don't take anything else away from this program, that's a very important one. Great. There was another question that came in, and I'm throw, throw, throw this at you. Uh, there's a, uh, one of our participants has, says that they're fighting their construction company for defects since 2014. And every time an arbitration or a meeting is scheduled, they uh, have some way to slip out of it. And the question is, when is enough enough? Uh, is that when oh, 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 oh. Okay, so, um, uh, um, developers, um, and, and, and by the way, at the beginning of my career, I actually worked for a developer um, as an attorney. Um, and so I, I don't think that developers are, are um, inherently bad people. Um, but, but it is a business um, and the builders are gonna act with, in a way that's in their best interest. And if, if you allow them to delay and to escape and then they will, because it, then it means they don't have to pay any money. Uh, so the things that, that for example, that we do um, is um, uh, we hold them very tightly <laughs> to, um, to whatever uh, uh, the schedule is because we know that nobody starts paying significant amounts of money until uh, they have the um, the arbitration date or the trial date, you know, on the horizon. Um, uh, I can't imagine how somebody was been been um, fighting with their construction company since 2014, um, and um, uh, I, I don't I don't know how they got I don't I don't know how that could have possibly gone on, frankly. Um, so I'm. Uh, you know, maybe afterwards they can contact me. I can go over the specific facts because that makes no sense at all. Normally, one of these cases is going to take um, 
uh, from beginning to end, from, from initial contact to, end, to the very end, you know, two to three years at the most. So um, something going on in 2014, I, 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 I can't even imagine. Um, uh, uh, so um, yeah, um, that's, uh, I'm kind of a little dumbfounded by the question. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine how that would have happened. You know, I'm, I'm going to just hypothesize here. Again, sometimes it goes back to the willingness of the board to move forward. You know, yes, uh, in a very proactive way. Uh, and sometimes boards, it goes back again. And I'm saying this for the benefit of our participants here. I know, as having been a board member before and looking at these things, it's just a big decision to spend money where I don't know if we can get it back. Uh, that's where people like you come in and offer the expertise that you're uh, sharing today. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, kind of attracted me to this whole discussion. I know from an educator's perspective over the years, I've gotten questions about what do we do about construction defects and all that. And I said, listen, you got to get a special attorney to do that uh, because that's the one that's going to handle it for you. Uh, and don't try to do it yourself. But I'm, 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 I'm glad to hear you saying all that you're saying here. And there are other options other than the uh, contingency-based attorneys. You can also have fee-based attorneys, whatever you want to do. But the main thing is to have positive uh, uh, representation there that can take, can take your, your position for you as well. Uh, let me, I want to ask you another question about the uh, construction defects. How does this work if you are dealing with a uh, condominium conversion uh, where you have a con apartment complex that's been in existence for 25 right, so, years? So um, there's, there's good news and there's bad news here. Um, the good news is that um, uh, um, a company doing a condominium conversion um, is required uh, to do a uh, kind of a reserve study um, and, and then um, fund whatever repairs are going to be necessary um, within the first 10 years um, after, af after the conversion. Um, and and, if, they, and, and um, if they don't do that, then the, um, they will be deemed to have uh, uh, warranted um, uh, all, all those components. Um, um, most developers uh, will, will do the study um, uh, but they won't. They won't fund either in cash or with a bond or some other way uh, the cost of doing the repairs. And as a result, the, the, the law will imply that they're war they're warranting all those components, whether they built them or not. Um, the dangerous thing about it, though, are that the statutes of limitation on condominium conversions are really, really short, um, and 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 they're even more complex than they are for uh, original construction. Um, so. Uh, I don't even like to talk about how the statutes work because of, because of how complicated they are. And so what I can say to you is that if you're in a condominium, can, if you buy a conversion, um, uh, you need to be contacting an attorney uh, really immediately because uh, the, st the limitations periods are really short. Um, but if you get inside those limitations periods, you have pretty good rights. You have pretty good rights. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, so that's really that's really the advice that I give is, is if you're in a condominium right. room and there's anything wrong, contact an attorney immediately. Good. I want to address something that's probably not in your purview, but uh, we had a question about engineer life safety system legislation. Uh, just to let you know, they're still debating that issue. Uh, this installing those engineer life safety systems in older buildings, uh, the big same thing like the sprinkler systems and everything else. It sounds like a good idea, but how do you pay for it? Uh, oh, right, right. You know, that's an, and, and I understand that there's a lot of people that are retired that are on fixed incomes. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a reason why uh, new buildings are required to have them, <laughs> um, and that's that uh, in these uh, in these high rise buildings, if you get a fire or something, it can be really devastating. So. Um, it's a, it, that's a tough one. It's a tough one, but but you're right. The 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 um, the, let, the deadline has keep, keeps being extended, and so it's it's still out there. But um, uh, there there are no mandates. Um, we got a, we got here, Fred. Um, 
It says, so um, basically we can hire a firm like yours for the first 10 years and that's correct. Uh, but they said, but if a property is 20 years old and, uh, and the residents are having many problems, you know, gutters causing leaks inside and uh, other kinds of issues, uh, would there be a legal claim or is this simply wear and tear? Um, well, the thing is, is that it could be the result of construction defects, but the statute of limitations would have expired by that point. Um, so it could be a construction defect or it could be wear and tear. Um, it would depend upon the type of construction. Um, normally, even at 20 years, you shouldn't have water pouring into a building um, uh, and certainly not on a, a, on a, a large scale. So my suspicion would be that there were construction defects, but um, there's, it's going to have to be treated as a maintenance problem because a claim wasn't brought within the first 10 years. And that question I was looking at too, uh, Paul, is that they said it was a townhome uh, as well. Uh, how Do we still have, for example, a townhome would be part of an HOA. It would not have the common elements in a condominium per se. Would that if there was a construction defect within the 10, 10 years, would that be take, undertaken by the individual owner? Um, no, we, we, we represent, we probably represent more townhome projects than we do even condominiums. So it's, it's very common. The, um, the uh, scope of a claim that a townhouse a project HOA can bring is narrower than it is in a condominium. Um, basically it has to be for um, uh, the roof, um, the structure, or any component that the um, HOA is required to repair and maintain. So for example, in many townhouse projects, um, the association is responsible for the roofs, um, um, uh, maintaining the exterior stucco, uh, what we call the building envelope. Um, and it's also true that many times in these kind of, in these townhouse projects, uh, e even if the individual owners are responsible for um, the exterior stucco, what it turns out is that the water is leaking in and getting into the structure, the wood structure behind it. Um, and, and that allows the association to bring that claim uh, on behalf of all of the owners. So um, uh, it's not as broad as it is with a, with a, um, uh, with, with a condominium, but, but the exterior building envelope is generally uh, within the ability of the association to bring a claim. In the townhome, you would also have to examine the HOA documents to determine where that maintenance responsibility begins. Correct. You, would, we would, you have, you have the, the, the legal term is called standing. Do you have the standing to bring a claim, the right to bring a claim? Um, some of the standing for homeowner associations is going to come out of the statute. Um, and then some of it is going to come out of language in the, um, in the CCNRs. Uh, you know, and I was going to go back to um, uh, to the question you raised earlier, uh, Fred, and that was uh, I got a little uh, sidetracked on the on the notion of releases. But after you go through this seventy five day period um, and you and and you proceed with litigation, the way that works uh, typically is that you're going to sue the developer and the general contractor, uh, maybe the same party, uh, but but um, uh, sometimes it's separate. And what they're going to do is they're going to, um, in addition to filing an answer to your complaint, they're going to file what's called a third party complaint. And that third party complaint is going to name all the subcontractors um, who were involved in the project. Um, and, and, and by doing that, uh, one of the things that you end up doing is you having uh, much more insurance that's available to, uh, to meet the claim. Um, uh, most of the money, um, for settling these claims comes from insurance companies. Um, I, I am as much uh, an insurance coverage attorney as I am um, a construction litigation attorney uh, because you can prove the claim, um, but a lot of these uh, builders um, and even many of the subs are what we call single project um, LLCs. So they form a, a limited liability company just to build one development. And then after they get the money and they, they take the profits and they shut down the LLC. Um, um, uh, we also went through a big period where a lot of them went bankrupt. Um, but ultimately that does not stop you from pursuing a claim against the builders and the subcontractors insurance companies. 
And um, it's been a very, very rare case when we have not been able to track down um, enough insurance um, that we were able to, um, to satisfy the uh, association's claim. Um, so that's another, another big factor. We get that a lot. What, what the builder's gone or the builder you know, closed shop or, or they declared bankruptcy. Um, we can still get to their insurance. And, and that's good to know. I mean, from that was uh, something I was going to mention too. I know I am an inactive general contractor, for, but I was active for many years. I still carry liability insurance. That's a wise <laughs> thing. To, well, you need to carry it for you need to carry it for um, ten years after you stop building. And uh, we always, in our contractor continuing education classes, emphasize that as well. Um, there's, a, there's never an end to the liability out there somewhere, it seems like. Right. Well, um, you, you, there's actually products out there in the insurance market called tail coverages, um, mm -hmm. where, where you can buy a policy um, at somewhat less expense or declining expense um, um, if you're no longer building anymore. And yeah, that's, that's exactly what I have, as a matter of fact, on those things as well. That's, that's um, the right thing to do. Yep. And somebody asked a question about, um, um, is there a problem with the board allowing modifications to the building uh, after the developer's gone, whatever it might be, uh, with, uh, uh, without getting the proper hurricane protection? Does that have anything to do with the uh, construction defects or is that going to be any live? Well, that's, that, that's really outside the construction defect context. The, the one thing I would say is that um, if you're going to be making any modifications to your building, um, you really do want to have an architect or an engineer, um, uh, Florida more commonly engineers, take a look at it to make sure um, that there's not an underlying um, defective condition. Because once you start modifying your building, um, you, you provide a, kind of a ready defense for the builder who says, well, it's, it's not leaking because anything I did, it's leaking because of what you did. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to, uh, uh, to prove that. Um, but it's certainly anytime you're modifying a building and reducing its uh, resistance to hurricanes and, uh, and wind and storm damage, it's not a very good idea. And modifications have to comply with the building code requirements as well. Oh, absolutely, a a absolutely. You start doing work and, and you're, uh, you need to make sure that you've got a building permit and you've got a licensed contractor and that licensed contractor has got liability insurance and it's got workers' compensation insurance. Um, uh, yeah, it costs a little bit more money than the, the guy or the gal driving around in a pickup truck with a, with a box of tools. Um, uh, but, but if there's a, a claim down the road um, and, and you didn't follow the right procedures, you, know, you could be facing a, a breach of fiduciary duty claim. I think that covers about everything that I have on my list here. And Paul, do you have anything you want to offer summary or do we have any other questions? Um, well, I, I, again, I, I want to go back to that, to that, to the, uh, the same point I was making in the beginning. Um, there's, there's really nothing that's more frustrating to us uh, than to be called in to um, meet with a board and, and to find out that they've known about problems for quite some time and just never got around to dealing with it. Um, and, and as a result, there's, there's no way we can help them. Um, so um, nobody wants to believe, uh, myself included, <laughs> that you have construction defects in your home. Um, nobody wants to believe that they're serious, um, but you just have a limited period of time within which you can bring those claims uh, and it's very important um, that you that you move forward. Um, uh, a number of years back, um, there were very few firms like ours um, that did work on a contingency basis, uh, and so an attorney would they would consult with an attorney, which was certainly the correct thing to do. Um, and the attorney would start to estimate how much their fees were going to be and how much the cost of the engineer was going to be, and the associations would say, "Oh God, we can't." can't afford to do that. And, and, and they probably couldn't, they probably couldn't. Um, but there are contingency fee firms out there now. Um, and, um, and, and we'll take on that expense. Um, obviously not, not, not out of our own personal benevolence because that's how we make money, um, but we know what we're doing. And so we can, we can evaluate a claim uh, and determine whether or not um, 
uh, it's viable. And, and if it is, um, we'll go ahead and advance the money to make sure that the association um, gets a recovery. So um, if there's a problem going on, please do not sweep it under the rug. Um, come talk to somebody. Um, and the first person you talk to doesn't work on a contingency fee basis, then talk to somebody else because because we're out there. And um, um, and we can get your project fixed. Um, that's what we do. And I think that's very commendable because you're not going to take the project unless you have a high. No, well, that, see, and, and, and maybe that's another thing to, to talk about here just a little bit. I don't know how much time we have left, but um, okay. when you hire an attorney on an hourly fee basis, um, that attorney's going to get paid no matter how your claim turns out. Um, 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 the engineers are going to get paid no matter how your claim turns out. Um, and, um, and, you, and you're going to be left holding the bag. Um, an, another problem that we see sometimes too is that people are convinced to go hourly because they think it's going to be less expensive, um, but they really don't have the money to do it properly. And, and they end up uh, severely compromising their claim because they, they either don't investigate it fully um, or they just get tired of paying the attorney's fee bill every month. And, and, and therefore what they do is um, they, uh, they just say, listen, you gotta, end, you gotta settle this. Whatever, whatever we can get is fine, we're tired of paying, uh, just get it over with. Um, and, and of course, when, when you do that, you know, you're not really gonna be getting anywhere near the kind of money that, um, uh, that you should be getting. Um, a contingency fee attorney, um, by, by their nature, we have to go fast because the, the longer it takes, the less money we make. Um, we're gonna wanna maximize your claim because that's how we maximize our claim. And, um, um, and uh, we, we, uh, certainly we as a firm like it um, because uh, we feel like it puts us in the same boat with our, with our clients. Um, we all wanna get it done as soon as possible. We all wanna maximize the amount of money um, that we get. Um, and um, that's, a, that's not really the traditional sort of hourly fee way of proceeding, um, uh, but, but it, is, it is nice. Um, Another thing um, uh, to watch out for, and this is uh, particularly true for managers, and that is that most managers have what, um, what I call their, their sort of their, their go-to contractor. It's a person they call whenever there's a problem in one of their projects. The person will go out there. Um, they're very good at coming up with um, uh, not very expensive ways of approaching a problem. Um, um, and you know, it, it's not necessarily going to solve the problem in its entirety, but it at least, you know, by the association, three or four or five more years. Um, the problem with that kind of a contractor, when you send them out on a project that's less than 10 years old to look at a problem, is that they understand that their bread and butter is solving your problems uh, and solving them as inexpensively as possible. Um, and if they, if they do that, um, uh, they may end up covering up a problem um, that comes back three or four or five years later, um, and, uh, and that underlying problem is now beyond the statute of limitations because you were certainly on notice of it. Um, so you really want to be, uh, you really want to be careful about that, um, that well-meaning contractor. Um, that's not really the person you want looking at a project that's under 10 years. As I said, if you're doing repairs on a project under 10 years, odds are pretty good you're dealing with a construction defect and, and you need to have somebody who's knowledgeable take a look at it. And again, it won't, it won't, if you go to the right firm, it won't cost you anything. They'll go out and take a look and say, yeah, it's something we're interested in. And, um, and, and no, we're not interested in it because it's not really that serious a matter. Um, uh, the, the other thing I would point out is that um, a, a lot of us uh, uh, contingency fee attorneys um, and hourly fee attorneys, Will, um, will assist in the developer turnover process. Uh, and that's a good idea too, because then if you have issues that are coming up, um, you, can, uh, you can have representation when you go back to the developer, you can make sure the developer turns over everything they're supposed to turn over. Um, most of us will do it for a limited flat fee, just to make sure the association gets, um, gets on the right track. Um, so that, that's a, a, another thing to keep in mind. Um, it's a little bit tricky because when a um, association is going through turnover, um, before the turnover occurs, um, they don't have control of the board, obviously, um, and therefore they don't have control of the purse strings. Um, they don't really have the power to sign a contract. Um, so they really need to enter into um, what is in essence a, um, a gentle person's agreement <laughs> that um, the attorney will provide assistance with the turnover process 
um, and that after the turnover occurs and the board is, the homeowners are in control of the board, um, that they can in fact, uh, they will in fact pay the attorney for uh, his or her time assisting them in the, um, in the turnover process. Uh, but but it can be it can be very helpful. The, the the one thing you really really want to be careful about though, is that um, a lot of um, builders will hire a general counsel or community association attorney to assist the association. Um, and um, uh, I don't want to be disparaging anybody, but um, if you're hired by the developer and you get a lot of business from the developer. Um, Whose interest do you think that attorney is going to be looking out for? Um, I think uh, co common sense um, will, will, will come to bear. You, you, re you really want to, after the turnover process takes place, uh, you really want to be looking at um, uh, somebody who wasn't uh, who wasn't hired by the builder. Um, the one exception to that um, is that there's a lot of uh, management companies that do get some business from uh, uh, builders. Um, but they understand um, who their ultimate loyalty is. And, and so after you go through the turnover process, um, it's a good idea to, uh, uh, to you know, talk with your manager uh, or management company and, 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 and find out where their priorities lie. Are they going to look out for the builder or are they going to look out for you? Um, and a lot of them will be, will be focused on looking out for you. So that the, that's a good thing to determine as part of the turnover process. Well... Good stuff. And, and before we continue, uh, I'm Jeff. I'm back by the way. Hi, everybody. Uh, and I want to bring on uh, Diana as well, because I want Paul and Diana. Diana is the director of marketing for South Florida. I want you both to uh, please tell everybody how you can be reached. What is the best way to contact you guys? Website, phone number. Please take it away. Paul, well, you first. Well, um, uh, you know, the, the one thing I, I, I would say, and this is kind of a, a, an added bonus, if you go to um, our website, which is constructiondefectlaw.com, mm -hmm. um, you can get all of our contact information, uh, number one. Uh, number two, um, we have on that site, um, I think we're up to like 75 maybe um, uh, videos that are um, that, are, that wow. answer all the common questions that, that we, we do actually these uh, extensive internet searches to see what kinds of questions come up. Cool. And then we have, you know, they're like 60, 90 second videos that answer those questions. So you can scroll through the questions. If you have any, find one that you like, you click on it and you get a little 60 to 90 second um, answer to, to that one question. So that could be something that's really valuable. Um, uh, yeah, we would uh, we would encourage you to um, uh, you know contact. Um, this is a South Florida thing, so so primarily our, our right. Fort Lauderdale office. Um, uh, um, uh, but the, the, if you go to the website, you'll really see there's a lot of information that's available uh, for free, and that you can um, that you can um, you know, get a hold of without even talking to anybody. <laughs> Uh, no, that's cool. And, you know, you mentioned South Florida, but uh, Gray Systems works with the entire state. What other, what other parts of the state um, does Angus and Terry provide services for? Well, we have, we have an office, as I said, in Fort Lauderdale. We have an office in Orlando, uh, and we have an office in, um, it's a town called Palm Harbor, but it's a suburb of uh, Tampa. Okay. Um, and, and, and we handle cases uh, uh, really throughout the state. So, um, so we're, we're, um, we can really take care of anybody. Um, we have cases way up on the Panhandle um, yeah. and in, in, the, in the south tip of Florida. So uh, we're, we're prepared to go really anywhere we need to. Fantastic. That's great news. And uh, I see we have no other questions uh, from the audience at this time. So I want to thank you both. But please don't go away. There are a few questions that we have that are not related to this topic. So please stay on for a few more minutes. But Paul, Diana, thank you so much. You. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful session. And this has been recorded and will appear on our, on our website, uh, graysystems.com, uh, in a couple of days or so. Paul and Diana, thank you so, so much for appearing uh, with us today. And we hope to have you back again. Fred, um, any, any parting words for Paul? No, I just want to say thank you very much. It's been very informative for me. It's kind of funny. I'm always on the back end of these uh, issues. And it's... Uh, uh, questions that I've had before, and I've always been, uh, I've always said, well, yep. go to the attorneys, but he, it's very informative. I really appreciate your. Yep. Uh, my parting thought is if you have a question, please ask it. We're not going to charge you. Um, I'd much rather get you on the right path um, than, um, 
that have you think like, oh God, it's an attorney. I can't call them. Uh, <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. Uh, hopefully you've seen, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. <laughs> and um, are you wearing, are you wearing pants now? I mean, your camera's on. I, I, I actually am. Cause you know, <laughs> you're going to fall off the table. Um, but, um, but please, you know, re reach out to us. We, we'd much rather, you know, answer your question. Um, as Diana said, I've been practicing law for 35 years now, and I've seen pretty much everything that can happen. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to somebody about it and, and, and set them on the right path. And oh, I'd just like fantastic. to thank, thank you so much. Will. And Jeff, I'd like to thank you and Fred. And of course, Paul, he's always, you know, Fred and Paul are very good. They're always full of information and knowledge, and I love it. And I just want to let everyone know that we are here for you. And that um, if you need anything, you can contact me as, uh, here at uh, the Fort Lauderdale. I'm in the Fort Lauderdale office and my area is all the way from Monroe County to Martin County. So I can meet you in person. I can take you to lunch. Uh, just give me a call and I will be able to set things up. And of course you can email Paul directly, but I, I, I am here local for you so that I can assist you. Did you say lunch? I'm, I'm calling you right yes, now. Yes, lunch. <laughs> I love to take people to lunch. It's my job. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you both. And, and you're both welcome you. to stay on for a few, few you know, you, you, you can leave, you can stay on. I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions that were written in that are uh, not sure. related to this topic, but you're more than welcome to hang, hang out if you want to. Um, Fred, uh, we had a couple of other questions that came in. Uh, one of them is, is interesting and right up your alley, right up our Gray Systems alley. How do I become a CAM? What are the uh, what are the steps? The uh, he's asking for the USA Today version, not the New York Times version. So, <laughs> what are the steps of becoming a CAM? Well, there's a two step process. You have to take a course, uh, community association manager, your course. Uh, most importantly, you have to file an application with the state of Florida, uh, DBPR. They have a website, myfloridalicense.com. You go to that website, and they have a tab right on the front page says apply for a license. You can do that at any time. You don't have to complete your education first. You could do that right now. Uh, as part of the application, you, you're gonna file your personal information. And then when you, if you have not completed your education, they will say you're deficient and they won't process it until they get the certificate of completion. But in the meantime, they've already processed it. You know, sitting there. So, uh, so you have to have your fingerprints done. That's done electronically today as well. Uh, you have to file your application uh, and then your certificate of completion for the course. That gets you qualified to take the state exam. Uh, and we offer the pre licensure course that Diana mentioned earlier. Uh, it's three formats. We do a Zoom class. We also have an electronic version as well and a correspondence course. Uh, there are fees involved. There's an application fee a filing fee of 200, uh, I think it was $38 and 50 cents, uh, 223.50, okay. you pay that. You have to pay um, uh, for your fingerprints, both to the state or background check to the state and fingerprints to Pearson View, the government, whoever does your fingerprints for you. Uh, once you're approved to do all that, you're approved to take the exam, take a state exam, it's hundred questions, multiple choice, you have three hours to take it. And within, from the time you file your application until you actually, your license can happen as quickly as two weeks. It used to be. Wow, I was just going to ask you that question. That's fantastic. It, it used to be three to six months, but now with the electronic fingerprinting uh, and all that, it, it can be done very quickly. Um, so we have our program available, uh, pre licensure course. Uh, people, people can take that as many times as they like uh, in pre preparation for the exam. Uh, as Diana mentioned earlier, we historically have done this all over the state, various locations. Yeah. Live instructors. Now we're doing it Zoom. Diane and I are both working together on it. Mm -hmm. uh, well received in that respect. Uh, and I know I like it because instead of driving to Pensacola to do a class, I get up in the morning, walk up, and <laughs> <laughs> ready to go. But anyway, that's that's how you get a license. Uh, with the More importantly, is to contact Brace uh, Systems yeah. and take that course from us because yeah. I can tell you that I took the course. And years ago, I'm a licensed CAM. I took it from Gray Systems, and they are very thorough. So we are thorough. Uh, also, any of this information, if you go to our website, graysystems.com, system, or call our office, it's a, a toll-free number. It's on all of our information there. I've got people there willing to help you do anything. Very confident. Uh, if you have problems, they can solve them for you. You probably don't want to talk to me. 
to talk to the people who can solve the problems for you. I yeah. take care of you, but um, uh, I, that, that's that's our major part of our product. We do this pre licensure to continue education for this instruction as well, and some other professions also in the continuing education world. And uh, I'm not a master of any of those. I'm just got a little, little bit of knowledge about all of them. Uh, you are a walking encyclopedia. In fact, I've heard some describe you as writing the book on this stuff, especially in the CAM world. Yeah. Uh, Fred, another question that came in um, about elections. Okay, I know we've covered this briefly in the past, uh, but uh, th this isn't going away uh, with regards yeah. to virtual elections, Zoom. Um, briefly describe uh, some of the best practices for holding uh, board elections via Zoom virtually. Yeah. or any, any virtual platform. Zoom is kind of like saying Kleenex and tissues, but um, virtual elections. Well, first of all, uh, there's some requirements in the corporate law regarding virtual meetings. And the board needs to adopt a resolution authorizing board and membership meetings that can be held virtually. Uh, there is no provision in our uh, community association laws that addresses virtual meetings. Uh, so it doesn't prohibit it, nor does it recognize it as happening. I expect there will be legislation this year to facilitate that, but we don't know yet. Uh, but uh, real quickly, for condominium elections, uh, board member elections, it's quite simple. There's a process in the law. You have a ballot, you have a ballot envelope, you have a return envelope. Uh, all that's done, uh, whether you're in, at a meeting or whether it's done virtually, you complete the ballot, you put it in the ballot envelope, put it in the return envelope and get that back to the association. There is no need for a meeting to conduct the election in a condominium. Uh, if you do have a meeting, you can have it virtually. Uh, the members can attend uh, uh, by, by virtual means, but they have to submit a ballot. The ballot cannot be submitted electronically. So it has to be done physically either the mail or dropped off at the uh, central uh, drop off point uh, of the office, wherever it might be but all the voting is done by the ballot. Uh, and that can happen whether you have a quorum or not. It's a little more problematic in an HOA. In an HOA, in order to have a meeting, you have to uh, conduct business at a meeting, you have to have a quorum. Uh, that's the big problem. Uh, and uh, apparently it's been well accepted. If you do have that board resolution of recognizing a virtual meeting, then those people in attendance virtually do count as being present in person. You also have the proxy issue where people can still uh, uh, issue a proxy and name somebody else to for, attend for them uh, based on the requirements of your documents, who qualifies to serve as a proxy, where it might be. Uh, the big challenge in the HOA is to get enough people present to have a quorum, uh, then they're gonna vote uh, either virtually or uh, in person uh, according to their procedures and their uh, documents. The nice thing about an HOA is uh, 30 years ago now, they reduced the quorum requirement to, uh, it cannot exceed 30% of the membership. They could be a lower number provided in the documents. So it's much easier to, to attain a quorum now. Uh, but that, that can all, as I said, you can do it virtually through the Zoom platform or the other platforms out there as well. Uh, it pretty much standardized uh, as well. Uh, but the, uh, until, well, as far as, as far as that's concerned right now, the only big, big requirement is adopting that board resolution uh, authorizing the virtual meetings. Okay. So that's a quick, dirty way of looking at it, but yeah, that explains it. Yeah, I've done a few where we've actually pointed, I've, I've instructed the uh, people in attendance to point the laptop, point one of the cameras at the folks counting, opening the envelopes, and it's been very successful. You know, there are a variety of ways of doing it. So yeah. thanks for helping yeah. to clarify that. Um, we have one more before we uh, let everybody get to lunch. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, and Airbnb, short-term rentals. Um, Anything on the horizon and uh, pending legislation that you're aware of that you want to share? Uh, yes, there is a bill in process in Tallahassee that's going to receive a lot of opposition from local governments. And the bill in Tallahassee, which is being supported by the short-term rental operators, uh, takes all of the short-term rental regulation away from local governments and places it in the hands of the state. Uh, whereas, uh, for example, Sunny Isles in Miami area, uh, they have a ordinance prohibiting it. I'm not sure how you enforce it, uh, but the local governments would not be allowed to do that. Orange County a couple of years ago 
pass some ordinances authorizing Airbnb type operations in local neighborhoods. Uh, they have certain guidelines and rules they have to operate under. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's gonna be an ongoing problem. Now, there is no uh, answer right now. I encourage everybody to monitor the legislation. I can't remember the bill number right now, but if you go uh, short-term rental legislation in Florida, you get it. Uh, there's a website called, so called Online Sunshine that you can access all the bills going through the legislative process as well. If anybody wants to email me at fgray at graysystem.com, I'll send you the links to that legislation as well. Uh, there is no fix yet, no answer. I personally don't think the bill is going to pass. I think there's going to be too much pressure from local governments. They tried it last year and it got shut down in committee. It never made it to a floor vote uh, in either house. Uh, as long as the local government's going to keep putting pressure on them, I'm not sure we're going to get anything out of that as well. It is a problem. I recognize that. Uh, in a lot of uh, communities <clears throat> where people are very sensitive about their neighbors showing up for three nights uh, and uh, checking in at the front desk and, you know, wondering who's staying in that unit this week. Uh, and we get a lot of uh, complaints about that. But to answer the question, uh, it's, being, it's being addressed we don't know what the end result is going to be. And Fred, it's Senate Bill 522. Senate Bill 522, thank you. Correct, you're welcome. Uh, Diana, you're so quick. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I track this stuff. And, <laughs> I love it. You I are wonderful. You are wonderful. And then uh, the last question that we have here, uh, this this will be the last one of the day uh, um, before we head out. Um, our HOA, this is kind of specific, but uh, maybe you have a general, general suggestion here. Our HOA has a gate. I guess a, a mechanical gate that is 40 years old. Board members want to leave the gate open to extend used life. I'm not sure what that means. I guess leave, it, the, leave it in the up position. Security is compromised. Uh, do you ha have you heard of this happening elsewhere that you can maybe offer suggestions on how that was tackled in some other places? Uh, at least that's how I understand the question. The, the issue is uh, what are the requirements and the documents of the HOA? The document right. of the HOA reference the uh, gate, if it referenced the fact that there is, quote, security, which is nebulous in, in, in and of itself, uh, what that means, uh, then the board is going to be hard pressed to not utilize the gate. Uh, the, if there's uh, uh, general language that says the board has authority to uh, open or close the gate as necessary, then they can probably leave it open during certain times. I know one of the neighborhoods where I live, it's not, I'm not an HOA, but one of my neighbors, neighboring HOAs, they leave the gate open during the day, but at six o'clock, the gate closes. Close it up. But that's in their, in their documents. Uh, I happen to be involved in Interesting. that development as well. Yeah. It goes back to the documents. If the board has the authority to do that, uh, there is no fixed answer. I think the more critical part is the board should undertake um, uh, a financial plan to make sure that there's adequate money to maintain the gate uh, and provide that quote security, if you want to call it security, because whether it provides security or not, people bought there because it's a gated community. And that's one of the reasons. So that might be something the board needs to look at. So no, no hard or fast answer on that. It's a, it becomes a document issue. Also, I always like to go back and say, uh, HOAs don't have the extent of regulation that we see uh, in condominiums or even cooperatives as well. Uh, so it becomes more of a document issue than uh, something from the statute. And also recognizing it always takes action from the owners. They're going to take <laughs> sort of action against the board. They're going to do that or not. The three uh, famous words, Paul. I mean, uh, Fred. What's a, <laughs> no, nobody told me. Yeah. And sue the board. <laughs> um, I was going to say spend the money, but you know, <laughs> but around three three word phrases. But uh, so that all right, that wraps it up for today. I want to thank everybody, uh, Paul and Diana. Please, one last time, uh, mention how everybody can contact you. Uh, you go, Paul. They can. Uh, we put it up on the on the chat board, so all the information is there. Uh, they can go to our website, um, constructiondefectlaw.com, um, and. Um, they can call our office in Fort Lauderdale, 954-839-6200. Um, or they can track down uh, Diana, who's always around. There you go. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you.
Excellent. It's been so much fun, Jeff and Fred and Paul. I just enjoy these. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I really That's appreciate great. you being with us, Paul and Diana, always. It's a great, great, uh, great presentation, great program. I enjoy it. And with that said, thank you so much, everybody. Be on the lookout for our next gray area to be announced very soon, coming towards the end of March, in which we're going to be covering community association managers and self-managed communities, challenges they face, uh, challenges and uh, successful stories during COVID and a plethora of other wonderful surprises. So be on the lookout for that. Thanks so much, everybody. And we will see you in the gray area next time. Bye now. Thanks. Thanks.